Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and we're here to discuss the defense from that Browns game on Sunday. Obviously, very disappointing loss to the Raven, for the Ravens to the Browns. Joining me to talk about the defense is Denard Melton of the Fire Zone Show. Denard, how you doing? I'm good, sir. Thanks for having me on tonight. All, always a pleasure. Uh, always good discussions with you. You're a former linebacker at JMU, a guy who certainly understands defense well. And uh, I think a, 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 the fair amount of the fire zone is devoted to defense. Is it not all, not all devoted, though, right to it? Probably about 99%. The rest okay. of it is us <laughs> talking about some current events here and there. Okay. All right. Well, there you have it. So anyway, <laughs> this is a, uh, a perfect episode to have Denard on, to say the least, after a game of – some substantial defensive breakdowns, some substantial missed opportunities. Um, they get steamrolled by a clean a Cleveland offense that had not scored 20 points in a season, hangs 29 on them. Admittedly, it's Jameis Winston and not the, uh, Deshaun Watson. But how do you how you mental health walking through a game like that? You wow. Um, I think mentally you kind of you have to kind of reset. It's an opportunity to look at a film because you're only going to watch it once. If you watch it more than once, you're going to drive yourself insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's an opportunity to take everything that has been wrong all season and see it on tape. Every Everything that's been masked by the offense, by their production, it happened in the Cleveland game. And to me, it's kind of funny because what was that? 2021, it was the Cleveland game that basically got everybody fired. <laughs> at the linebacker role uh, with Peanut yeah. and and Kenny Young was traded. That's 2019. 2019, 2019 yeah. yeah. It, yeah, it has right. that, that feel of they exposed you. How do you fix it? Yeah, they're they're two and two after that game, and that that game that defense they did rebuild on the fly. One of DeCosta's greatest greatest achievements for sure. That offense was too good to waste. Yep. Uh, it's it was every bit as good as this offense. In fact, it was probably better um, in in terms of scoring per drive. It was in Lamar's uh, first MVP season. But uh, you know this this is there's more going on prior to this game. That was very scary. Obviously, they had a number of internal things going on, starting with the injuries on Monday Night Football. We really didn't know how serious they were, uh, particularly the one to Travis Jones, which was what I kind of had as a flag in my mind the whole week. He only played two snaps in the fourth quarter. They played, I think, something like 28 or 30 snaps against the, yeah. for the Bucks did in that third, fourth quarter. Him not to be out there just didn't make any sense. So something was wrong, obviously. And you see him walking around in this game. He looks like a shadow of himself. Oh, yeah, that – that Monday night game, I mean, think about that. They went there warm, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. A game that shouldn't have been as physical as it turned out to be late in that game. Then you, it's a Monday night, so you got a short rest going on the road to Cleveland, who is more than fired up to no longer have to answer questions about Watson. I mean, it was set up for disaster from the very beginning. It, it really was. It was one of those games that had trap written all over it, but there was more going on. They had two cornerbacks out. Of course, Humphrey lost in the first half after his two picks. The one guy who can catch the football in the, in the, in the secondary for the Ravens. We'll get into that a lot later, I'm sure. Um, also, Wiggins, Nate Wiggins, a huge loss. This one, apparently due to injury, Harbaugh gave – good optimistic chatter about today being back um, practicing this week, or he thinks he will be. Uh, it was just an illness thing. He says uh, he did have something else going on. He's had a shoulder problem. He's been dealing yeah. with the whole year, but maybe taking a game off actually might've helped that. But then the big one, Marcus Williams active on game day. And yet sat for the, excuse me, for the entire game with a uh, 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 an attitude problem, apparently. A personnel decision was made with regard to him. Yeah. Um, I, I've been in those locker rooms when, when, when these things go down. And first of all, I'm surprised it didn't get out before the game. 
like whispers of it. So mm-hmm. I guess you could say kudos to the staff and to the press playing playing right by the whole situation because it is an internal deal. Um, but as a former player, I pretty much can gather that there was a meeting on Monday or Tuesday. We'll pick a day. Marcus Williams walked in there. Marcus Williams didn't like what he heard. <laughs> that coach said some words. Marcus Williams said some not so fun words. And then, you know, the rest is you're gonna sit the rest of this week out, bro. He he was at the podium this week at some point, I thought. Mm-hmm. And, and he and he said something that I thought was extremely unfortunate for a free safety to say is basically you, you could say this differently, but you can't say it the way he said it, which is the ball's got to come to me. Well, that's not what you want to hear from a ball hawk. In fact, Marcus Williams comment that when he first came to the Ravens, and I know he's kind of being captured at a, in a, in a very bad way of saying what he believes is the same thing. What he said when he first came to the Ravens, if, if that ball's in the air, it belongs to me. That's yeah. what I want to hear from my free safety. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And he may mean that. He may mean like my cloud, you know, I've been I've been trying to roam all over back there, my cloud. I don't really think he's he's there because he also made some comments about usage. So, I'm I'm glad you brought this up. This is not the same defensive structure for the last 2 years. Mm-hmm. It's just not. It's got whispers and hints of the decaying days of Wink. They're out leveraged. They're out. I That Cleveland game, you knew when you walked into that meeting that week that they were going to be as basic as possible. I don't care how many years Winston has played quarterback. He's not going to get a full game plan. He's just not. And that's what you saw. You, did, you saw a very basic 20-yard dig routes and leaks out the backfield. If you roll the tape from 2021, what was the Achilles heel for every Ravens game every year, every week? It tw- it was the 20- same w- stuff. W- w- we talk about 2019 or 2021 again now? 2021. Okay, so 2021, well, Lamar's injury certainly was a was a very big deal when that happened. Um, but they, they, they had plenty of other problems as well uh, that year. They Oh, without question. But it just – it had that Chicago Bears hint to it, just – lost and desperate for no reason. And it just, it just, it, it's seven weeks of it. Let's go back to the, to the comment about Winston. Cause that's a really good one. I thought Winston, if I were looking at him as a poker player, I would say he plays his own cards. And I thought that was true with the, the, the Cleveland mm-hmm. offensive coordinator. They gave the Ravens every opportunity they could to win that game. It wasn't just the balls Winston threw right into the hands of the Ravens defenders that didn't get caught. It was the fact that they didn't really seem to be playing to the weakness in the opposing matchups. They were just trying to hit their own receiver. Um, yeah. You know, Winston's trying to see, see receiver, throw to receiver. I mean, that's really all he's, all he's trying to do under those situations. And they didn't take nearly as much advantage as they could have of, well, J.A.D., for one thing, who looks completely lost out there, just can't get his head turned around. Um, Stevens is a particularly weak cornerback against back shoulder throws, and, and they did some of that in this game, and they did some to to, to lose him crossing. Um, I, but I just, I, you know, they really picked on Jackson a lot. And Jackson, um, they, I don't think it was as much a matter that they were picking on Jackson as much as they were throwing to the deep middle and tried to hit try to hit his receivers and then you know he happened to be in a place to make a play i know he wasn't trying to throw the ball to jackson in the end zone uh and i know he wasn't trying to throw the ball to jackson on that post route that he was defending yeah um it's just a matter of of he happened to be there and i just winston's playing his own cards he's, he's really not trying to figure out what the weakness is if they really did they would have ran the ball right down the raven's throat in that second half and then hit two defensive linemen oh yeah it was no question i just it's interesting watching Winston play and just the weirdness of the calls that were coming from the Ravens. And it just seemed to me that with the weird calls on third down, 
the weird calls in the red zone. It just seemed like everything was just the coordinator just seemed lost in what needed to be done with, in essence, a guy that hasn't played in two years. Yeah, yeah, he 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 barely has been. He's in for the last week, looked reasonably good, but he's he is just playing backyard football right now and trying to pick up the pieces. He's a pro. I mean, you know, you give you gotta give Winston credit for that, but uh, but he's not trying to figure out, oh, we need to take advantage of number five over there. Oh, 39's on the back end. Yeah. We, we gotta funnel yeah. everything through that zone. No. <laughs> no, you you you've you're you're sitting there and I I I hate to say it, but it was almost like the defense played scared the entire day. They never were attacking. They were always reacting to what Cleveland was doing. And I understand the injuries. I understand that you're a light on a defensive line. But what what do you hang your hand, what do you hang your hat on defensively? Like, what do you do good besides running the, you know, defending the run kind of, but teams yeah, they, stressed, haven't really stressed you, and Cleveland should have stressed you more. Yeah, they, I mean, they did a pretty good job of defending the run, even with their really um, degraded line. Um, so I thought that was that was something good to take away from the game if you're if you're looking at that. Um, they didn't miss a lot of tackles. That's often the case with a tired defensive team that missed tons of tackles. Ravens won the missed tackle battle big time. It's something the Ravens' characteristic, their central characteristic as an offense, is to force a lot of missed tackles. Jackson forces mm-hmm. them, and and you certainly get plenty from Derrick Henry, and you get some from all the receivers too because they all have got some shiftiness and some speed yep. that can get, get away from people. Um, in this game, Cleveland missed 22.8% of their tackles. They missed 16 tackles on the day. The Ravens missed just seven on the game, and they've got the best they are the best tackling team in the entire NFL. As bad as their defense is, they're the best tackling team in the entire NFL. And th- mm-hmm. that I can still say is 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 going pretty well for the Ravens, but there, there were a lot of other things <laughs> that, yeah. that obviously didn't work out. You asked who could they really hang their hat on. I mean, you know, it was mentioned during the broadcast that the only – ball player they have out there who can get get a pressure is Kyle Hamilton and it was true um you know when they were rushing for that Cleveland had Jack Conklin back at right tackle and he's pretty good and they had Juan Jones moving in at left tackle who is a hell of a lot better than Jedrick Wills is and he really looked at in this game uh who who did a pretty good job with OA I thought um and they just it didn't have a lot of defensive playmakers left Uh, you know Smith they didn't really use use as a pass rusher so it really meant that it, it it had to be Hamilton making big plays, and he made one, but he didn't make the second big one. Yeah, that that Cleveland offensive line—that was the first time they were healthy all year. And yep. having Teller back, they just looked like a different line up front, different than what they've been playing with the last six, seven weeks offensively. So, you know, once again, circumstance meets opportunity. And you caught a very beat up defensive squad with a very rejuvenated but basic offense. And that's where my struggle kind of is with the Ravens defense right now. Some of this is self inflicted, I feel, with the defensive linemen not activating more than four. And no matter what you think, they activated four for this game because Travis Jones wasn't ready to play. And, and they had to know that in advance. So, you know, you, you bring up Daryl Worley, you bring up somebody else, anybody else who can even move and push off a little bit with their feet um, would have been a would have been an advantage over Travis in this game. Plus, boy, the Ravens need Travis Jones. He drives their entire pass rush, as mm-hmm. far as I'm concerned. I mean, he commands doubles on the inside. He gets mad at BK free for one-on-ones. All the good stuff that's happening on the edge, or a lot of it, is based on what Travis Jones can do to compress the pocket on the inside. It's just it's so frustrating to not have him healthy. And then you lose Pierce, who's the most similar player to him on the team in terms of ability to push the pocket a little bit. And you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's extremely frustrating, but you can't, again, they went into a game with four defensive linemen plus we'll call it 4.1 defensive linemen. They went into in terms of the snaps they could have expected. And they, they decided they didn't need to bring a fifth. And this is the game. Of course, they get two injuries. And yep. I, I would say, 
as much as anything that cost them the football game. Uh, and there's a lot of things you can point to, you know, that oh, yeah. cost them the football game. But but that as much as anything, that would have been one one of the elements. Definitely choices and game plan did not help the circumstances that the back-to-back road games and the short week. I understand. Don't get me wrong. The, the, the game plan was what was available to them because of the short week, because of the injuries. And you can even look on the offensive side. Our offensive line does not handle power rushes very well. Just yeah. it's it's just not a good thing. So they have to game plan accordingly. And the fact that those dudes had eight to nine guys in the box all day, people are going to say they should have ran the football to help the defense. But Cleveland made that a point to say, you can run your head into a brick wall all you want and he can get his 25 carries, but it's going to be the hardest 100 yards he got. It, it, the easiest piece, easiest <laughs> piece of advice I'd give to someone who's watching, not even film, just watch the game. Count up the number of players in the box. If there's eight in the box, you should probably pass the ball. Yeah. If there's seven or six in the box, you can run, particularly seven with a point of attack offense. That's fine. You can run the ball in those six. If they put six in the box, they're daring you to run. OK, yeah. and that's that's, you know, basically the Ravens, something they've been good at for years was was stopping the run with a with a basic nickel four two five defense um, is is uh, it's unusual when a team can do that. Um, Cleveland didn't really get to that point. They had a lot of like six with their overhang or their, their slot corner, like cheating to the inside. Yeah. Um, but they, they didn't really, they didn't really have too much of that. But they but they put, had a lot of they had a lot of of heavier boxes that they showed them and they the Tampa. I don't know if you caught caught this, Denard, but the Tampa game, I know you guys cover mostly defense. Tampa played 4.15 defensive backs per play. It means they're basically in base defense the entire game, including like third and long. Okay. And <laughs> it's, a, it's the strangest thing you'll ever see in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, so they, they even the, the Bengals the previous week who loaded up really heavily were like 4.6 um, – uh, uh, defensive backs per play. So less than nickel, but half, you know, about 60% of the way between base and nickel. So uh, just it, it, some That's ridiculous it. things you see in the NFL these days. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on. L- Ravens had a lousy day on both third and fourth down offensively and defensively. Uh, they, they went two for 10 on third down. They went 0 for two on fourth down, including one of the big plays that lost in the game. Meanwhile, the Browns, who didn't go for it on fourth down, went eight of 15 on third down um, in a way that, uh, you know, obviously was a very big, uh, big deal. And this is now two games in a row where they've been destroyed on third down, 11 of 17 for the Bucs and now eight of 15 for the Browns. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing I've I've seen over the last few weeks that has become an alarming problem is third down defense and red zone defense. Like you're going to give up yards because you, because of the type of offense you're, you have, you can play. So teams are going to attack you. So the two things that you can control, obviously defensively is your third down defense and red zone. And I, it's just been non-existent and it's been, I can go all the way back to the Cincinnati game where the problems really started to show up with bad red zone calls and bad third down calls. Cause they, at that point, Joe Burrow is just literally just standing up and throwing where you guys are not going to be because you've become predictable. Mm-hmm. And you have played Joe so well the last four games playing him zone playing tight zones, playing a lot of man-free type stuff, and then you roll into that game, you don't run zone blitzes inside of the 20, and then you're doing the same thing this week against Cleveland and doing way too many rotations and making guys have to come from 15 yards deep to stop an eight-yard hitch. You're not going to win a lot of those battles. you got to have – safeties who are in a different league from Eddie Jackson 
in yeah. terms of making those rotations on time. That's a very difficult thing to do. You know, they had great safety play last year. Marcus Williams was playing better, even though he's playing, you know, with one shoulder from a coverage standpoint, he's still pretty good. And his, his time in the first two years, I thought for a per snap basis was just outstanding. It, the, the problem was he couldn't tackle last year. And then you think this year, well, he's finally healthy. Everything will be fine. And now he's got other problems. He's just messed up on, on, on where he needs to move um, and, and not doing it. And that may be part of his frustration with what's going on is he's maybe part of the conversation whenever it occurred um, is that he's very frustrated with, with Orr's defense and not liking his role in it. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what's wrong. I, 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 the Ravens have done a good job of keeping it in house. Absolutely. I, I think the one thing you, you kind of have to be aware of what we haven't heard this year. I don't think I've heard it. You haven't heard those glowing things you heard about Mike McDonald. When he first came in, those, oh, it's simple. We can play fast. We can play physical. Like, you haven't heard that, even from the very beginning. It's been guys being late. I mean, you can even see it in the corners breaks on on in routes. Like, they're hesitating. And Darius Washington is very, like, on that, I want to say it was one of those plays at the end of, of the fourth quarter where, he should have been much closer on the outbreak, but he hesitated for some reason. Mm-hmm. And it's just like a lot of that going on, a lot of hesitation, a lot of reactions on defense. You can't play defense in the NFL like that. You're going to get steamrolled. I think you might be talking about that third and seven play to the outside where it converted a first down for them late. Yep. And yep. That was a big play. That was one of the really big plays in the game that, uh, that ended up costing him. And I agree with you. We've seen that from our Darius, even though I thought he started the year extremely well, he gave up a couple of touchdowns, one in the back end of Dallas and another one, it might've been the Bengals, but it was in the back left corner of the end zone where he was late on the break going to the outside. Um, I think they've probably seen some things on film from him, Uh, but he's got the same disease that everybody else in the secondary also has in terms of not being able to hold on to the football, uh, which is obviously very, very frustrating as well. I, I, I let's. I want to get to that point and then move on to one more that I think is really the central part of this entire show. The first is um, the Ravens have 39 passes offense and five interceptions. Um, what would be your way of trying to correct this in terms of all levels of football you ever played? Um, wh- what do you start with, with the secondary that they're getting tons of interception opportunities and they're there? Which is that's half the, that's that's not even half the battle. That's eighty four percent of the battle. That's a catching the catching the ball is about the last sixteen. Um, how do you, you 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 maybe tell me differently if you think differently? But then tell me about about what the hell do you do with a group like this? You tell them to stay away from the from the football field for a day. Just <laughs> just just go away. Just go play video games. Go be with your family. Like go get away from it. And come in with a fresh mindset. Defend, like on the back end, just hey, new season. We got eight more of these. Like let's let's refocus. But also, the coach has got to put guys in positions. And except for like maybe a couple of them that hit dudes square in the face. There's been a lot of reaching, a lot of balls that should have been picked off and guys are late getting there. And once again, even with, I was watching the Seattle game against Buffalo. Even in that game, even they got blown out. There were guys who were still in position for balls if they were off by like, a half a centimeter or something along those lines. There are guys there, but Josh Allen was on point. James Winston wasn't even close to that. And we still had guys reaching for balls, had guys just – it's a mentality, but it's also make it easier for your guys. Don't have them rotating and flying all over the place. Have quiet feet, quiet hands, and it'll make your life easier on the back end. These guys are scrambling to get in coverages. 
And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, the ball's there. They're not, they're reacting. They're not being proactive. They're not attacking the football. Everyone's kind of just like, oh, I don't want it. I, I, I don't want to minimize that in any way, that, that, that getting them there late has a difference and you'd rather them being breaking on the football as they see it kind of thing. There's, mm-hmm. there's a lot of value to that. So, so I agree with it. I, I just think we're so far beyond that in terms of a hands problem on this team. And it's not just a hands problem. The other thing is it's a tip drill problem. They're, they're not getting into the process of tipping the ball up in the air in the secondary. They just do, do and the big, you know, Eddie Jackson had a third opportunity in this game. Okay. little aside here. Somebody in Cleveland, whoever is doing the game book out there, whoever is scoring the game book, get on the on the same page with the rest of the league in terms of what constitutes a pass defense. Because Eddie Jackson had his hands on the ball three times. Okay, one went through, went through his hands and and uh, and was incomplete. Another went through his hands in the end zone and was incomplete. And then a third where he tipped the ball behind the receiver, tipped it up, and it, it he actually tipped it too flat was the problem. And our Darius Washington, who was in a position to make a play on the ball. Uh, then wasn't able to do anything with it, which was which was unfortunate. Um, also, the Hamilton um, drop did not get counted as a PD somehow. So the Ravens' PD total is understated at thirty nine, and they're they're just I mean they're they're really badly not catching the football. The tip drill is the other component of this that I want to get in with you with you is how, how do you get in the mentality that part of the goal is to tip the ball up in the air as opposed to just seeing if you can get any kind of piece and knock it down especially when you're behind the receiver. So you're already the deep bracket on a receiver. So when I played, I played some safety in college and I played some safety in high school. And for me, I always knew I was going to make the tackle because I knew I was fast enough. I know I was going to get there, but as a safety and I'm sure Ed Reed has said this, you kind of have to play the tip. You kind of have to play the bad throw because you're never going to get there. You're going to get there every once in a blue moon and make a great play on the guy, knock the ball down, or you're just going to cover the guy. But if you're one of the better safeties, you, you're not baiting, you're just waiting. You're waiting for a mistake. You're waiting for a tip. You're, and you gotta have that mentality. And I feel like no one wants the ball on defense, and it's weird. It's just a weird vibe that is just like ball in the air, and everyone's like, "You got it. You got it. You got it." Nobody wants it. <laughs> well, it's it's funny because you what you're describing, I describe as loose bracket safety play, um, and and Ed, Ed Reed is the greatest player in NFL history at exactly that is playing a, playing a loose bracket. Deshaun Elliott is a tight bracket player. He would always go directly for the midsection of the player in front of him without really considering that the, the tip is a significant opportunity. Right. Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a problem though. I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing any attempt to tip the football up and create opportunities for players behind you at all. I, I just, it's it, a mentality. It's something you either preach it in camp or you don't. You run drills for it or you don't. And it doesn't seem like a lot of ball drills were done in camp. It seemed like there was a lot of installation that was done defensively because this defense is a lot different than it was even from last year, even with the blitz setups and how their coverage is. It just seems – it just seems unraven like a few years ago, they used to do the tennis ball drill occasionally in camp and they had some problems. They had a whole year where they got like six interceptions. Then they did the tennis ball drill the next camp. They didn't do that this year. Um, that, that was, by the way, defensive players love that. Um, you know, Suggs always wanted to get opportunities playing with the defensive backs to try and try and play the tennis ball drill. Um, they don't, they just, they, they don't do that really anymore. They do a lot of drills about fumbles a lot of slip and slide, a lot of, you know, work through a gauntlet of defenders who are all trying to punch the ball free kind of stuff. They really don't do the, do as many tip drills. I didn't notice it. I was out there almost every day this camp. I'm, tr- I'm trying to remember even one instance where they were playing the ball in the air like that. Um, but uh, but I, I honestly can't, can't remember one. 
Yeah, it's a very... I When we were in camp in JMU, we preached, you know, obviously tackling, running to the football. But if you, you do those two things, the other two things come with it, which is fumbles and interceptions because you're running mm-hmm. to the football because all eyes – because we were predominantly zone, matchup zone type of team. So all eyes were on quarterback. You're all watching the same movie. All watch, yep, all watch the same picture. So we can all get on the same page. This is not happening this year. It's what happened last year. It's happened Mike McDonald's first year. That more eyes on the quarterback means – more opportunities for tip balls to be intercepted. Now, the difference this year is we're playing a lot of fire zones and guys dropping in coverage. I mean, I saw Van Noy drop in coverage for the first time in a year and a half, and I'm just like, what have, what have we moved to? And then that's – and what was that, two weeks ago where like, the wheel route got them? And you see Trenton Simpson kind of pointing like, hey, that's yours now because the back has moved to the other side. Like, Oh, on Van Noy, yes. Thing. That was a great post-play exchange there. Right. But even, even before the snap, you can see Trenton Simpson kind of pointing back at him like, I can't trade now because he's moved on the other side, so you have to take that. Mm-hmm. That's changing – the f- the function of your defense when you have to tell another guy that now now that's his man it's just it shouldn't be that way well van noy as the kind of veteran he is knew he had made a mistake a mistake immediately he that he had failed to cover the running back on that play which was great by the way cuz simpson is a is a second year player running up to van noy who's 34 years old and telling him where the hell were you kind of thing and I mean, he's talking mile a minute as soon as he got there you know, he just put his hand up, put it on his chest, I think. And it, it clearly was indicating, even though you, you, his back is to you. So you can't see exactly the, ma- the words he's mouthing. Uh, my fault, I got it, you know, kind of thing. My, my bad. And Simpson knew immediately to shut up at that point, which was, yeah. I, I thought that was a good exchange, at least from that. Point. Absolutely. A veteran stuff. But there again is when people say, oh, it's a communication issue. No, that, that is a scheme setup problem that was exposed because you watch tape. You can put guys in positions, and that's what good offensive coordinators do. That's what Todd Munkin does. You think he does all this jet stuff for his funds and games? No, he's trying to see what the secondary is doing, who's rotating down, what the linebacker's doing. Is, is, the, is the line stemming left to right on movement? No, they're not. Okay, then I can come back to this. That's what's happened on our side, and we're not responding. You you definitely want to put your players in a in a in a spot to respond. By the way, I really thought Monken made a huge mistake in this game on the fourth and one direct snap to uh-huh. Henry. Just you take all the misdirection out of your offense, the, the big strength of it. You don't even have to have Lamar touch the ball. And then I don't know if you saw it, but it was a while before Lamar got covered on that right side. He was uncovered. It, the ball could have been snapped. Henry could have had the ball right out to him. Uh, (laughs) This holiday season, find the perfect gift and spark something special with Uncommon Goods. No need to stress, Uncommon Goods makes shopping easy with hand-picked, unique gifts for everyone on your list, all in one spot. Think gifts that bring out the smiles, the laughter, and that, yes, it's exactly what I wanted moment. They scour the globe for one-of-a-kind, handmade, remarkable items, and they always seem to know the perfect gift. I got these... Camden Yards drinking glasses on it that have a nice etch of Oriel Park and the skyline around it. Check out their new officially licensed NFL collection for you Raven fans. When you shop Uncommon Goods, you're supporting small businesses and independent artists. Many of the products are made in small batches, so make sure to get yours before they sell out. With meaningful gifts from personalized items to special finds for kids, sports fans, and book lovers, Uncommon Goods has something for everyone. Plus, for every purchase, they donate $1 to a nonprofit. Over $3 million donated so far. To get your 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash ravens. That's uncommongoods.com.
dot com slash Ravens for 15% off. Hurry, this deal won't last. Uncommon goods, we're all out of the ordinary. I'm sure he wouldn't have thrown the ball, but it would have been an interesting thing. They just got too cute offensively on some on some things. And, uh, sure. <laughs> We're not, we're, we're, that's just not our, it's just never been a part of our offense. I, I understand you're setting up something for against Kansas City. I get it if you get there, but stop. <laughs> you don't have to do that anymore. They, they have to, they have to get to that game. And it's, it's a non trivial task for them to have the privilege of going to Kansas City this year for the AFC Championship, which is about the, Best they can hope for, I think, at this point with three losses. Yep. Let me let me ask you the, the question I really was was building up to though. Ravens defense has problems on on sub, several levels. It, it has problems with the players themselves. I think very clearly in terms of who they have left on the defensive line, in terms of who they have left in the secondary right now, uh, uh, specifically at safety. Um, it has problems with the coaching. I think a lot of the things you're bringing up maybe not just scheme situations, which I'm dis- differentiating, and they may be coaching situations. If you want to put in the same bundle, that's fine. But there's a hard-headedness to some of what they're doing that may be more about you might need to figure out how to change coaches to be more adaptable, to be more um, uh, able to identify things that are happening on the fly. Um, if, let's let's start with that. Uh, um, is, is there it, was this too big a job for for Zach Orr at this at this point? For where you were trying to go, yes. I think that's the simple question. Uh, answer to that question is you you have all the pieces of a super cal- Super Bowl caliber team, and I understand you you know you want to build within, but. This team was ravaged by coaches leaving on the defensive side. And what was left was a whole bunch of inexperience. And now you bring in P's where you're trying to give a little bit of confidence, but Dean P's ran something completely different than what we're seeing now. So I'm not sure where he steps in and makes a difference because I thought by now there were hints at Tampa where things were starting to calm down a touch on the back end. But then the last five minutes happened. You're just like, wow. And then it just spilled into this game and it was just, it was just hot garbage everywhere. Yeah. The difference in the two games, the, the, with Tampa, they played a ton of plays towards the end of the game. They played what 25 out of 28 or whatever it was consecutively because of a three and out and a um, onside kick, kind of the same formula at Dallas was like 24 out of 27 there. Um, it's very hard for a defense and you as a defensive player, you know, this mm-hmm. to be able to continue to rush the passer under those circumstances, for example. So you're automatically kind of exposing your back end um, to, to, to whatever the other quarterback wants to do to you. Um, and if he, if he's capable and, and, you know, Mayfield is capable, then, uh, he's going to probably be able to move the ball pretty successfully against you, against your defense. And then they, they also were kind of playing loose umbrella, not trying to, not trying to juice it up. This game I thought was different. And the reason I thought it was different was, or realized on the last drive, first of all, they, they were driving for the win. So they had four down football to play to, to try and get the win. Actually, actually, once they get to the other side of the field, it might've been three down football because they could have tied. But they they had a three point lead. I think three or four. No, they had a one point lead. One point lead. One point lead. Yep. Three so so it, it could have been three down football on the other side of the field. In fact, they were in that dangerous part of field goal range that the Ravens won the bet with it with with Cincinnati. But the last se- seven pass plays of the game, uh, the Ravens rushed five and allowed ample time and space. Rushed five, dropped two, allowed ample time and space. Rushed five, dropped two, allowed a ball out quick. Rushed six, got a pressure with with uh, Smith getting a pressure. Then they rushed six again, got a pressure with a quarterback hit for Tavius Robinson. Rushed six again, ball was out quickly. And then they rushed seven, and the ball was out quickly for the 38-yard touchdown over, over Jackson's head. They were trying. They really were trying. They knew they didn't have enough to get after the passer with 
what they had left on the defensive line. They were trying to do it with whoever they could get to. It just it 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 didn't work. I actually liked that adaptation because it's high risk, high reward. And even though they gave up the touchdown pass in that situation, it kind of was like they scored too quickly. Kind of like we scored way too quickly, but then they scored too quickly also and allowed a minute left for Lamar to get the ball back and a, and a, a chance for the Ravens to come back, even though it didn't work out. I mean, I, I, I agree with that. Like, if you're going to be aggressive, be ultra aggressive. But my only issue is that third down call. I think they were third and 15. They had a third and seven that was, they only had one third down. So it's the third and seven where they allowed the PR seven to the outside that I think, I think it was Washington who gave up the play. No, I thought it was, um, was it because they got the first down and then I, either it was an incomplete and then they got the penalty. Second and 15. You're right. It's first, and it was first and 15 and then second 15 was the touchdown. Second and 15 was the touchdown. Yeah. Okay. I, my issue there is you've got an opportunity to keep them to a field goal. And that's going to be a long field goal. I, I, that's where I'm just like, the second and 15, you can dial up if you're smart enough on defense as a defensive coordinator, you can dial up blitzes to make them dump it in the flat immediately, particularly against a team that was super basic and what they were trying to accomplish. Completely true. And wouldn't you agree they did exactly that on the previous play? Because the previous play, they rushed six. Mm -hmm. Ball was out quickly. Hamilton had the ball in his hands for an excruciating number of steps. It seemed like 30 minutes roughly in my head that he had that ball in his hands and was going between his hands with it. And then it finally comes out. Um, I, I thought that was that was pressure that really worked. Now, admittedly, it's ball out quick in terms of, of him getting rid of it. So it didn't, you think in some ways the pressure didn't impact him, but it did. I mean, he, he overthrew yeah. that ball. And yeah. And, and so when we hear Harbaugh in those situations, remember sometimes he kicks early on plays. And I, I, I always hear him coming back to that and say, we know we're getting the all out blitz. So I just thought it was time to kick. And this is one of these cases where, where the Browns knew they really couldn't afford to have it be the place they kick from. Or if it does, it was sub Right. Yeah. So it's like they they wanted the touchdown. Yep. They knew that 50 – because remember, they were – the dude on, on the TV was saying that Tucker and everybody cooking, kicking this way was having problems with the win. Problems yep. with the win. He was – he he missed one earlier that – you know, yank left because problems with the win. So that's where I'm like the game management, understanding the situation, playing to where you are on a field. You have a second and 15. He just threw one of the worst balls you've ever seen. And you come back and give him a free post route on a safety who's flat footed, who hasn't moved in a week. Right. It, it wouldn't have mattered how he started that play, by the way. If he was up on the balls of his yeah. toes and knew exactly what he was doing, he's, he's going to get outrun by Cedric Tillman. He's going to get out of heighted by Cedric Tillman on that play yep. to out, out left. Uh, okay. Let's, I, I, I appreciate this. Always love talking football with you, Denard, but we got to move on a little bit. And I, yep. I, what I wanted to ask you is this. Where do you go at the trade deadline for this team? And, and at least three general categories is one, don't really make any moves at all. Play, play your cards as they are. Two is try and make moves that are generally pretty cheap because this team has a modest chance to go far this year, but an all-in move doesn't guarantee you shit this year, frankly, in terms of, of going in. That would be my thinking if they if they were thinking that cheap was a way to go. I respect it. Um, or do you go all-in and do you, do you try and get a player who you think can really help this team this year to win this year um, and screw 2025 and 26 if necessary. Because you got a lot of big contract decisions coming up this offseason, by the way. Yeah, I, I, I'm i not going all in. Okay. And I, I know some people are like, why, why don't you go out? Because their offensive line is not ready yet. Yeah, I agree with you. It's, just, it's, it's going to be 
I, I hate to be a spoiler, but it's going to be the detriment to this team. If it's the first round of the playoffs or the second time, they just can't handle power rushers. They just can't. And now you want to throw some picks at the defense. The defense is young, except for a couple guys. So I don't think there's anything out there. Like, yeah, you can go get a pass rusher, sure. You can go shore up, maybe get a clowny and, and you know, get some more thrust up the middle for protection for, you know, Travis Jones and, and Matabike. That's fine. But there are not guys out there that are worth, you know, a, a second-round pick that is going to make this team exorbitantly better defensively. Yeah, there's hardly anybody out there that would require a second round pick, in my opinion. But they're, they're I mean, you know, you could, could have had Devontae Adams for a third um, or, or third, you know, graded to a second if you're if you're going a long way. Um, the, the, the guy, the guy, OK, the trade I will propose to you, would you trade David Ajabo straight up for Jadavian Clowney right now? Because you get basically you get two years out of Ajabo, meaning a year and a half out of Ajabo versus a half a year, we'll call it out of Clowney. Yeah, because he's not going to get snaps over Yannick anymore because he's 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 lost those snaps. Um, I mean, if that's the best you can do for a former first round pick, I guess. He, I'll just remind folks, he should have been a first round pick in theory. (laughs) In theory, yeah. yeah. (laughs) Sorry about that, but yeah, it's. I just one thing is not going to fix this team. Yep, it's That's bigger it. than than you have talent on the defense. You have a guy who's lost in how to use that talent, but then you don't have someone on the defensive side of the ball. I understand Rokon is is a leader and 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 speaks that. But there's not a dude over there who's going to walk into somebody and terrify them to play better. That's not on this football team. That was Clowney last year. You can go down a list of individuals who, if you walked in that locker room, you didn't want to see that cat if you played badly the week before. Right. Or even worse, if you played half-assedly. Yeah. Yeah. People like Ray Lewis wouldn't wouldn't tolerate that. And, and ah. there's other guys, too, who who uh, who wouldn't have won that defense. Uh, Rod Woodson would be another one for the secondary would have been all over. But Ed, Ed Reed, in his own way, I mean, quiet, not, not a quiet guy. That's not the right way to put him. But, but he's almost like a like a um, doesn't have the right personality exactly to get up in somebody's face and 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 uh, get after them, even though he you know, he'd be a guy who would who would go to a film study thing. He really didn't have that personality for it. Ray Lewis, I mean, he's he, he's a scary dude in from a lot of ways in terms of what he. Uh, I mean, uh, you had Nada, like a D line is not going to walk into a D line group, and this man right here, you, you're not going to say, "My bad." <laughs> <laughs> With that big dude looking at you, like, no, you're not going to say "my bad" to a McPhee. You're not going to say a, a good one. Uh, "My bad" to. Even though he got ragged on his team from time to time, and Albert McQuillan, like he had enough stroke in that locker room to be like, "Hey man, like I've been here around here a long time. I see some cats come in and out of this place. You, you're not holding up the colors." And people are like, "All right, respect." Okay, yeah, that's that's a really he's a really good choice too. Um, the other guy obviously was here forever is Terrell Suggs, who who clearly had that kind of a. Uh, a dominant personality, but you're right. I mean, in a, in a lot of ways, they're, they're, you know, the guy who could have it, but I don't think he has quite the personality for it is Pierce. Uh, and I, I saw some of the stuff on him talking on the sideline with Travis Jones, trying to get right in terms of what Travis Jones even could do with a hobbled foot. That was good. But, um, uh, but he could be that kind of leader. It's just, it's not necessarily somebody, some people, it's their personality and some people, yeah. it just ain't. So, uh, 
All right. I, I, I want to move on a little bit, talk about some other things on the show. Um, the, the next thing was, was packages. I'm not going to go through all the packages. If you want that, go to my article. But here are the two things that I'll point out about the package choices that happened during this game. They played a ton of big nickel. And they played a ton, a ton of big nickel, which they played a good amount of big nickel all season. Good, good opportunity to get Hamilton up close to the line of scrimmage. But what they had to give up on this game was a dime. They didn't really have enough safeties that they trusted to have everybody in for the dime package. They played only two snaps of dime um, the entire game, which which is much less. They've been playing about 35% dime the last few games, um, about the second most in team history that they'd been doing it. Uh, but but the absence of Williams effectively made they, meant they had to abandon that. That was a big loss, even though I think Trenton Simpson played well. Yeah, I, I think once again, you had circumstances that, you know, made you have to play a certain way. And this team defensively just didn't have the horses to make things difficult for, for Cleveland in, in certain packages. And when you have to cut back 35% of your playbook, you, you see the result of that on the field. As one guy who showed up package wise, and that was Tavius Robinson, who got kicked inside seven times to play rush nickel. He actually was one time on a rush dime, seven times in a rush nickel. When you hear the word rush in one of my package descriptions, it means there's three outside linebackers on the field. Um, it, it, in those plays, the Ravens allowed only five total yards, and Robinson himself was quite productive as a as a pass rusher in this game, as productive as anybody was in this game. Uh, and both of their sacks came in that rush nickel. Uh, uh, look, it was a damn lucky thing they had that available to like draw on on any kind of obvious passing down because it's the only way they got defensive linemen off the field. Yeah. And Matabike and Washington were out there basically otherwise almost every single snap in the, uh, down the last 38 minutes and change of that game. You ain't going to do much with that yeah. when you're that light up front. And that's, you know, at the end of the game, that's that's the problem. And, you know, no fault. Yeah, they went in light, but they lost Urban, what, first series? First snap. First yeah. snap of his, yeah. He was gone. And then they yeah. obviously were hamstrung with roster construction because of what was going on in the back end. So your, your issues on the back end forced you to use – your two practice squad people that you probably would at least put Chris Wormsley up as protection for Travis Jones. Um, so, yeah, it's it's amazing what a couple well placed weird injuries can do to a team. So, I, I, what I want to know is what you and Michael on your show have been talking about about over relative overemphasis. Okay. Now that's my own slant added on this. So I don't want to, I don't want to get into this too much. I don't want to go down the road too far and lead the witness here, but um, they, they've activated a lot of special teams only safeties. Kane and Braid in particular have had activations already and they've had now three games. They went with four defensive linemen actually. And then this game effectively four because, because Travis Jones was hurt. Um, and it finally got to them for the, for the first time. Do you think this has any chance for a bulb going on that they need an extra defensive lineman active week after week? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I think so. it's it's weird that they have so many guys, like special teams guys active, and yet they kick it off into the end zone. Yep. <laughs> more than I've ever, like, and I know Harbaugh's excuse was uh, we're still young, and that's fine. But why are those guys active? If you're not only using them on punt coverage, which is really the only other full speed defensive special teams that is like left now, I, I don't understand it. And I don't know about you, but uh, the punter they may want to look for a replacement. For Stout, you're saying? Yes. Okay. I'm. I'm just not. He. He's. 
he's putting the defense in some bad spots where he should be a much better placement with his balls. Directional putter. Okay. I yeah. got you on that. All right. Like he's uh, like, like, I think it was a punt in the Cleveland game where he had an opportunity to put them inside of 10 and that ball ends up at the 15 and 20. And it's just like, that's 10 yards that this defense needs. And we're, we're killing us. And he flubbed that one against Oakland. Like that hurt that. And you can't say yes. Tucker is, is struggling kicking long field goals. But I don't know. Like I was listening to Pat McAfee talk about keeping the the the, the kicking lane clear, and 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 it's and it's not. It seems kind of cloudy down there. He he seems he seems like he does crowd that football a little yes. more as a holder. And and it is something, by the way, if you're going to have a special teams only player, I for for the point eight yards that having braid active helps you on average per game in terms of field position. And literally, I think that might be it. Okay. And if it were 1.5, my answer wouldn't change. If with three, my answer wouldn't change. I right. still want an extra lineman, but you know, the other position I would take, if you're going to, if you're going to ditch another special teams player and just have a, a otherwise Brent urban or somebody play special terms would be, would be to being cooked back as a, a full-time holder. Uh, you could you could actually yeah. bring him back as the punter too, but I, I bring him back as the full time holder. He's the greatest holder that ever was, and uh, you know he's he's the guy who's really teaching Tucker in theory. Uh, sorry, uh, Stout in theory how to how to do the job, but uh, but he knows how to do it. He has all the muscle memory. I'm still I'm sure sure left to do that job very well. I just think Stout has short arms. That's that's really the tough. issue. That's that's he's got to be tight because. I think Cook was a six four. Let's look that up. I, I I actually don't know, and that's uh, it's an interesting theory. I've never heard that said. Yeah, Sam Cook six one two twenty two, and but this isn't going to tell us it necessarily anyway. No, about their law, but it gives you an idea. Sure, six three two zero nine for Stout. So he's a little bit taller, but he might he might have still have shorter arms. We certainly see yeah. that with linemen. Fair enough. It's just weird. The if you watch, if you watch him hold, everything's very. He's very tight, and everything's kind of like in this small window, and I feel like it makes Tucker kind of have to swing his leg, kind of sh- like almost like a, a weird sand wedge, and he's not getting to drive anymore. He's not being able to drive the football. He's kind of chipping it. You can kind of see that in the strength of the kicks, but that's well, for another conversation. Sorry. Yeah, and I, another time. It really his his effectiveness has dropped off in these three years, and it does beg the question: Is it holder? Is it snapper? Maybe some, uh, and or is it just Tucker getting older? Yeah, and it's probably a little bit of everything. But mm-hmm. Tucker is fall on the sword, saying everybody's doing the thing right. It's my problem. It's my technical problem. I've got to work through. Blah 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 blah. And, it, and there's stuff about a crow step and this, but I agree. It's it's a it's a show unto its own. In terms of uh, of talking about those problems, let's talk about the pass rush a little bit. What there was um, in this game, obviously, it was pretty bad. Um, the overall opportunity set for uh, Winston, and this is one thing, boy, any kind of hand in the face would have really driven him nuts. I think in this game, coming back and and you know just playing for the first time in a while, but they only got ten pressures the whole game, twenty ample time and space opportunities. We've been talking about on this show that the the right the, what you want is about one point five to one pressures to ATS. This was one to two pressures to ATS. That's not going to get it done, and thirteen ball out quick. And he didn't even do that well on the ample time and space opportunities, but he had so many of them that it worked out. He should have thrown for about two hundred eighty three yards by my approximation system, and he actually threw for three twenty one. So. Yes, it was a problem that the pressure didn't get there, and it was still even more of a problem that nobody's catching on the ball or nobody able to defense the back end as well, which has been, that's been true the whole year. Everybody's been beating their expectation. Yeah. The, 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 the pass rush has suddenly gone quiet against two very good offensive lines. Mm-hmm. Tampa's is very good. I don't think they get a lot of credit, but I think their offensive line is very good. And obviously Cleveland with everybody healthy, that's a very, very good offensive line when everybody's healthy. Probably, Top two with Detroit. 
when healthy? Top yeah, three? The, the Ravens aren't up there anymore. That's for sure. Uh-huh. Um, the, 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 I mean, I think part of the issue is that the Ravens can't force the internal pass rushers to leverage what they have on the outside because they could always get one-on-ones on the outside with Travis Jones and Matabike on the inside. Travis Jones yeah. basically was forcing doubles on him. Matabike got great one-on-one three-tech matchups versus a guard, and then you had one-on-one. Anytime either of those guys wants to fan, um, they can do it. They can take him on single. And Gakwe probably came out of the crib wanting to fan that tackle out. Uh, he, he lines up. You can tell by how wide he lines yeah. up, how much he wants yeah. to play outside in, in space. But uh, but the rest of them all want it too. I mean, Oway wants that. Uh, Van Noy wants it as well. But, uh, uh, you know, just having Travis Jones be like he is right now, there's nobody is going to replace him. I mean, the Ravens signed Josh Tupo today, who is just – he is a body. That's it, to play – the uh, defensive to nose tackle, defensive tackle on early downs. That, that is all he provides you is a little bit of snap relief. Oh, yeah. um, but he's not going to give you anything in terms of a pass rush. Nah. Um, yeah. I, I, coming into this season, I felt like they needed another dude inside that could do some damage. And that was the position I've been running light with, and it's finally caught up with him. And now it's, it's, it's spread the virus has spread to the outside because now <laughs> you're asking guys who need one-on-ones are now getting protections turned towards them because they don't have to worry about Travis Jones inside. Yeah. Or because the, because you know, the pocket's not going to be compressed. You have more time to make chip blocks on the outside. It's just, yeah. it really does spread very quickly. If your interior guys cannot, cannot move, move people, move bodies, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, a few things happened in this game or had 17 pass rushes with five plus, I, you know, a lot of things went wrong and some of it is Orr's fault. Some of it may be whatever kind of relationship thing happened with the Marcus Williams thing. Um, whether that's on or on, on Harbaugh on, um, culture of what's going on, on, on just on Marcus Williams for playing badly. Let's, 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 Let's lay out all the players on the table because he certainly was playing some lousy football, you know, coming up to this game and probably deserved to be benched in a lot of ways. Uh, the Ravens just didn't have anyone to replace him is the unfortunate thing. But I, I do look at what Orr did in terms of rushing numbers and say that's a pretty good adaptation to what your limitations are. It's a, it's at least something. It's an attempt yeah. to to go after the quarterback. I agree. That that's an attempt. I just didn't like the way they went after it. Like the one thing that is now becoming a little more prevalent in in the NFL, you're starting to see it more and more, is formation into the boundary, trips into the boundary. Mm -hmm. Because on a defensive side, when you put formation into the boundary, we're going to call our blitz to the field. So now the offenses are now getting smart and saying, hey, we run found it, we run formations of the boundary. We're gonna overload that side because they're taking guys away from our trip side to the field. So now that's why you're seeing all those deep ends come in and all that stuff coming in. And it's just You got to be better about it and also have a better plan inside of the red zone. Let's let's slow down things down for a minute and tell people what you mean by the field and boundary, because it has to do with where the ball is placed. The ball in, in football, if you if you stop, if the play stops between the hashes, then the ball is placed where the ball is down. If it's anywhere outside, it's placed on either the left hash or the right hash, depending on the side that the ball is put down. The field side is the op- is the longer side of the field where you have the incremental distance between the hashes to the outside of the formation. You can think of it kind of that way. The yep. boundary side, um, and it, it, it still applies if you're two-thirds of the way towards one hash. It would still apply to yep. have a boundary side and a field side. Um, but you're in, And then talk a little bit more about, about what you mean with regard to that. So in essence, we, you know, if you're looking at a defense, you split the field in half split it right in half in between the hashes and has that ball moves towards either the left or right hash that is going to dictate because 
there's more field to cover just in the idea of the world that you need more guys to cover more field. So defensively, we are always going to protect our field. We're always going to protect more space. And when that ball, say it's on, you know, we're saying on the right hash and the bench is closer to the right hash. So now we're looking at, okay, they're most likely going to put their formation into the field because they want more space to operate. So when we blitz, that means we're going to come from the field and our protect, our coverage is coming from that boundary side. So those guys are going to have to cover a lot of field but you're anticipating that your pressure will get there before that ball gets out. Okay. Now what teams are now doing is now they're flipping the formations, especially on third down. They're not going wide side trips. They're going, they're going trips into the boundary with a closed tight end. They're forcing your rules. And that's what's happening with the Ravens is, your rules now completely change because your coverage is coming from a different angle and now has to cover all this field and they're always going to be chasing. They're always going to be chasing the routes and it's also going to be guys who never cover a lot of space. You're asking linebackers and D tackles Mm -hmm. and DNs to cover receivers for more than two seconds. It's not going to happen. We look back at week one and what the Chiefs did. It didn't all have this boundary field component to it because a lot of the plays were were in breaking routes, but it still has the same elements of your linebackers end up being the mismatch they're looking to get off a trips formation, say. Yeah. And and you got to do special things to break that up. Not an easy, not an easy task, certainly. I will tell you what, uh, it's it's such a pleasure to talk football with you because we get into a lot of detail on defensive football. Perfect guy to have on this episode. Um, First of all, tell folks uh, where they can talk football with you online and how to get to the Fire Zone show and who's your co-host and what do you usually talk about? So you can find me on Twitter um, under either Denard13 or at at the Fire Zone show. Um, You can catch us on our show with Mike Crawford. we haven't been as active this year, but we're getting more and more into it as this team becomes more and more ridiculous on defense. But um, you can find us there, and we're always talking defense. We're always, you know, breaking down what we're thinking going on and, and you know, just breaking down each position, skill position, um, to give you a better idea of what's going on out there on the field. All right. Outstanding. Denard, always a pleasure to have you on. Other folks out there, uh, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I've always got time for them during the regular season at a rate of about one per week, but good ideas I always have time for. Please use hashtag film study mailbag for questions. We're going to get to that in part two of the show where we have a few questions and they have been great lately, but please don't, don't censor yourself. If you don't think your question is great, we want to hear from you. It's, it's uh, some of the most engaging stuff uh, we get from you fans. Denard, thanks again for coming on. Absolutely. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.